Welcome back, everybody. Another amazing episode of the Expert Trader Podcast. We have a very special guest today. Mr. Austin Collins is in the building. Austin, welcome to the podcast. What's up, boss? Thanks for having me, man. It's my pleasure. Um, we're going to have an interesting conversation today about NFTs. We're going to keep things very ground level so everyone can understand how they can get involved. I know a lot of people see folks making money on social media, making money on the internet from NFTs, but maybe they don't know the first steps. So that's going to be the nature of the conversation today. But first, Austin, you want to walk us through a quick backstory on yourself and who you are? Yeah, man. So let's try to keep it, you know, high level overview. Uh, I've been in the industry for about four or five years now. Uh, started trading uh, back through a, a company called I Am uh, and just been learning through their different types of filtration systems and processes, learning a lot about the community in general and, you know, what even trading is, what Forex is, um, trying to get my understanding of how people you know, show on social media that they're printing money from their phone and living these lifestyles. And, you know, that's what catches people's attention. And then, you know, you say that there's expectations versus what reality comes to. And that's been the journey that I've been on is, uh, you know, really finding out my own foundation within uh, within this industry. So uh, I personally run my own holistic healthcare business. Uh, that's my first and foremost, uh, trying to give back to people and, you know, trying to help people align with their mind, body, spirit, connection, and intuition. Um, and then through this, uh, I've been able to now have additional free time to devote towards something like this. Um, so I've been learning, you know, in the space for the past few years, uh, had a lot of success trading, but most frequently has been NFTs. And that's been this up and coming, you know, transition in the space that I was able to kind of get ahead of the curve on. Uh, and that's where I found a lot of success as of recently. Um, I'm 26 years old, so very young, uh, thriving entrepreneur trying to, you know, just make some headspace in this uh, industry. All right. That's awesome. How did you transition over from trading to NFTs? Was it just the people you were surrounding yourself with or did you see something online that caught your attention? What was it? Basically, I had a, I had a friend uh, put a bug in my ear that, you know, he was having some difficulties trading and actually found uh, trading NFTs to be more uh, beneficial for him because it's less of an emotional roller coaster. Uh, when you understand, you know, the cycles of trading and a lot of the people that you've even had on this podcast talk about the highs and the lows of that experience. And with uh, NFTs, as long as you do enough research in the back of it, uh, you're going to end up finding good projects that allow you to create income on a daily basis. There's new NFTs and collections coming out every day. So instead of, you know, risking and leveraging different amounts on a, a trading account, you're able to, you know, mint different tokens and NFTs. And by the end of the day, flip it for more than what you could if you were trying to trade. Um, and it's something that I found lucrative to be able to share with people. Uh, a lot of people trading is very intimidating. And, you know, the joke on an NFT is, well, it's just a JPEG, right? So whenever people look at these uh, images, it's not as intimidating. You just kind of know what you're getting into uh, because there are obviously things to look out for and you have to have education in the space. But for me, it was kind of a, I'm still doing both. Uh, so I will trade, you know, in the morning, come about eight to nine o'clock, you know, kind of hidden that New York open session. And then I'll take out my profits actually and go mint some NFTs that actually uh, launch about five or six in the afternoon. So it's kind of like a, you know, instantly pulling liquidity out of the market and then putting it into something that's tangible. And that way, you know, I'm not over leveraging or blowing accounts. Like it's an instant kind of process for me that I've got a routine going now. This is going to be a fire conversation. If you guys can't tell already, let's go ahead and bring things back a, f a few steps. For okay. folks who are completely lost <laughs> on everything you just said, who said minting, tokenization, oh, what does any of this mean? If you can go back and explain to somebody what an NFT is, what is a non-fungible token? Yeah, give us your perspective on it. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people are reading headlines. Like I saw Justin Bieber just bought a board ape uh, yesterday, you know, and, and people are understanding like he spent a half a million dollars on this. And in my opinion, a lot of these NFTs are liquidity. He spent 500 dumps. Ethereum. Sorry. Or fi 500 Ethereum. Yeah. <laughs> That's more than half a million. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's a, a liquidity store for a lot of people, you know, during bearish and, uh, you know, bearish markets, it's a great project to be able to uh, invest into. So it's a non-fungible token that's basically built on a blockchain. Uh, so a lot of people are familiar with Ethereum, uh, open seas, and I've been focusing more on Solana blockchain uh, as of recently, which is, you know, connected to uh, currently a number one marketplace called Magic Eden. Uh, and this is where people are able to buy, you know, NFTs and tokens from there. Um, so these tokens are just a lot of different data points that are put together within the blockchain um, that people are just able to purchase. And uh, usually these NFTs have different 
uh, what's called use cases. And that's what, you know, additionally adds value to some of these projects. So if, if someone's watching this and they're like, I want to get into NFTs, is the first step, obviously that there's education involved, but should people be looking to own it? Like just mint their first one? Should people just be looking to get into the space first and kind of figure it out as they go? What should someone be looking to do if they actually want to start getting into this game? Yeah, so that's the easiest thing, uh, you know, and it, it's not really difficult. Uh, a lot of people, when it comes to trading, think it's, you know, extremely difficult and very intimidating. When you look at an NFT space, all you have to do is be able to create a wallet and fund it. Um, so, you know, there's either a MetaMask wallet if you're trading Ethereum-based NFTs, and then there's something called the Phantom Wallet. Uh, that I use personally for Solana NFTs. And actually OpenSeas is looking to bridge the gap in between Ethereum and Solana-based NFTs now to make both of them uh, now valuable. So that's a whole nother conversation, but uh, literally you just have to have a wallet funded that allows you to connect um, into these platforms uh, and then you're able to purchase. Now, where and what you're purchasing is the interesting part. So, you know, a lot of people- Wait, wait, wait. So hold on. right before we get into the what, <laughs> what and when you're purchasing it because there's a there's an obvious like chain of of how you can go about owning yeah. one of these things can you walk someone through the process of let's say mint to selling an nft from start to finish funding the wallet and everything else yeah so uh in order to start a process you're gonna have to purchase solana or ethereum uh on a some site or some sort of exchange you know most people will use some sort of coinbase um, you know, there's other exchanges out there, but you purchase the uh, cryptocurrency through there and you transfer it into these wallets, uh, such as a Phantom and a MetaMask. And then what happens when some of these projects are about to launch, they'll uh, basically do a marketing push on Twitter um, and through their own private Discord channels. And this is where kind of your research starts to take place on what actually is the NFT, what's the use case going to be, you know, how's the community coming together? Uh, that's one of the biggest things is the community aspect of it. Who's actually going to be holding these NFTs and why are they going to be using it? Um, usually then they will push for what's called either a whitelist minting opportunity or a public minting opportunity. Um, whitelist is usually for people who already own NFTs and are in kind of these exclusive communities uh, that already provide you access to getting early entry for minting a certain collection. Um, most Collections are usually ranging in between 3,000 to 8,000 different mints, um, which means those people have that opportunity to get at least one of these tokens. So what happens when it so comes mint, to mint? Just, a mint, just to be clear, is like the amount of NFTs that are going to be available for people to pick up? Correct. So um, let's say there's a project such as the Board Ape Solana Club. They minted a total of 6,000 uh, Board Apes. So this meant that there were people that had the ability to either, you know, mint one or, you know, 20. Uh, I personally minted 170. <laughs> uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. that was serious? A, yeah, there's a $15,000 investment on that. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and give a huge shout out to Austin, by the way. If you guys are watching this and you picked up any of the board apes, go ahead and flood Austin's DMs and say thank you. Shout out to you, Austin. <laughs> Got to give credit where credit is due. 170 yeah. is freaking insane, though. Yeah, man. It was uh, one of those things where I was looking at my wife saying, hey, this is either going to be something that was legendary or we were going to have to, you know, be eating ramen for a couple of weeks. And Fortunately, it was legendary and I told a lot of people about it and it worked out really well. So it's kind of just one of those things where, and especially in this space, calculated risk is everything. Those yeah, are so, anywhere between 10 to 100 Solana a piece, correct? It, correct. And I already sold one at 80 Solana. Um, so I made $11,000 on selling one NFT that I minted for $110. So that was, I don't even know what that multiplier is. I think it's 100x. <laughs> Pretty freaking close. So that's something that you can't find on the trading uh, platforms, at least not on $100 to <laughs> 11K. <laughs> All right. To go back to that chain. So there is, right. the, you go on an exchange and you put in the money. Then you yep. send the money from the exchange to one of these wallets. If it's Ethereum, you're going to be using MetaMask. If it's Solana, you're using uh, Phantom, right? Correct. Correct. Then, you, then you're going to go and mint the NFTs. So how does the minting process work? Yeah. So there's different launch pads that some uh, collections will utilize. Uh, and to, sorry, what's or, a launch pad? A launch pad is uh, basically a secure site that allows uh, you to mint a token safely and understanding that uh, it's actually a valid purchase of that NFT collection. Um, so this is something that 
people will use to facilitate that entire process. Um, you usually have an artist that will, you know, release the project and then it, they want to build out that community. Um, so they go through these launch pads where people have the option to come to. Um, some people do direct minting on their websites as well. Personally, I enjoy the ones that go through a launch pad uh, because for me, I feel more safe and security. That's a lot uh, what is up in the air in this space right now is the security and safety. Uh, some people have heard the term rug pull before. So there's mints going on every single day. Uh, and it kind of takes some of that research to understand what are some of the key points that you know, tip people off for if this is a valid project or not. That whole minting process, though, you then are able to mint as many as you want. Uh, some have limitations. Uh, if it's a bigger project, um, right. then that's one of those where you want to get on a whitelist or something uh, ahead of time. Now, this whitelist thing, this is actually something that I've been curious about. I'm trying to get on these whitelists left and right, and I can't get on. So yeah. do you know who they're reserved for? Do you know if there's any way to kind of like get yourself on that list? Yeah, so you want to get yourself into one of the bigger communities. Um, a lot of the communities that have uh, some NFTs that are already valued at, you know, a floor price of 50 or higher on uh, like a per sole basis or per NFT basis, uh, usually they get first priorities on some of these new collections because it's almost like a uh, community driven. If that project did well and these people are minting our project, then we understand that we're going to have long term holders you know, which may be referred to as diamond hands, somebody that isn't in there for like the quick flip almost. Um, but then you also have people that are almost day traders on the Solana network now. And um, you've even got bots that are, you know, mining NFTs as well right now. So on that launch date, whenever it says, hey, there's 6,000 tokens, somebody could put a bot on there and, you know, mint a thousand and then relist them on the market as soon as it launches for, you know, two X their money and they'll make their profit. Um, so there's if a you're lot making these, on. If you're listening to this and you make these bots, message me ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I, there's some wild conversations on what I've seen uh, going on in this community. And as you know, like, they're pushing for different regulations or different types of just structure for the system. And there's not much right now, man. It's the Wild West uh, and it really is. But uh, there's definitely opportunities out there. OK, this is awesome. So this reminds me a lot of 2017, because in 2017, that was, this was the first public hype for cryptocurrencies and making an investment in any specific, like in almost anything that you got was doing well at some point, And it was the Wild West. Today, there's a lot more regulation, taxes, and things like that on cryptocurrency. From when you first got into NFTs till now, how have you seen the regulatory framework change? Or how have you seen just like inside these group chats, them getting smarter, them organizing the chats smarter, avoiding scams? Like, how have you seen the space grow since you first got yeah. in? Yeah. So, so that's a, a thing to anybody who's listening to the podcast right now, NFTs are not supposed to be an intimidating way to enter this space. It's actually one of the easiest ways to enter the space. All it takes is a little bit of additional uh, time on your side to really dig into the communities of who's actually making these NFTs. Um, so I've only been actually doing NFTs now for three to four months. Uh, so it's not like I've been studying this for years. I just put in a lot of research time and energy. Uh, and a lot of these platforms launch through something called Discord. And they will basically organize these uh, and give you different roadmaps or different plans of actions on what the project is going to be doing. Inside, you can usually speak with the developers uh, directly um, who's you know in charge of the, the project. Uh, as well as they'll have moderators in there to help answer any questions. Uh, their goal is to basically entice you to understanding the use case behind their NFT, why it is going to be valuable. Um, so, you know, you have to really, before you mint any type of project, do your homework on what you're actually, you know, investing in. If someone's listening to this and they're like, what should I be looking for in a solid project with trustable developers versus a rug pull? A rug pull for you guys that don't know is like, basically it's a scam. Everyone puts their money in expecting something good on the back end, expecting the community to thrive, and they take the money and walk away. So what's the difference and how can people identify the difference early? Yeah, so uh, for, for me personally, I go directly to the developer. Uh, I want to be able to personally speak with the developer and, uh, you know, I'm very intuitive on who and what I'm working with. So being able to speak with them and study their language, understanding how they respond to questions. Um, people will put stuff in the chat that sometimes questions you know, the direction of the project. So whenever you listen to the response, um, that will tell you how that, you know, developer is going to handle adversity through the, the 
you know, journey of the NFT in the collection. Because at the end of the day, if they fold or if they don't answer it, then that means that, you know, they're very easy to shy away. And that's kind of how I judge it. I have to know who I'm working with. And if these are the creators and the founders, then I should have a personal relationship of some sort with them. Um, so that's how I always go directly to the source before I meant anything. Um, now, now can about, anybody do this? Can anyone get access to the developers? So it depends on the community. Um, there's something called doxed, uh, which means that the, uh, the developers will let themselves be known of who they are and you can research them. And then there's some that remain anonymous. Um, so it's actually funny, the Board Ape Yacht Club that everybody's heard of, they're actually a docs community. So, you know, they haven't really released who the developers of it are. Now, some of these other projects, and especially on the Solana blockchain that are newer and trying to set that foundation, uh, people put themselves out there to be known because there are so many rug pulls being made. Um, so usually when somebody doesn't, you know, share their personal information, it's very easy for them to run after the community or, you know, the mint is done and completed. Uh, then they'll literally, you know, just close up shop and nobody will know who they were. Are you familiar with like venture capital? A little bit. So are you kind of like a venture capitalist? Like you're trying to find <laughs> like startup companies <laughs> with developers that have potential and you're studying them, then you're investing in them early. And if you get in early, then the, the, the community yeah. grows, then you so grow with there's it. Di there's different tiers uh, to each community. So basically depending on sometimes how many of the NFTs you hold, They'll give you different rankings and different uh, opportunities. Meaning if I hold, uh, let's say 10 of a certain NFT collection, they may give me a free NFT, you know, after a 30 day period. Uh, you know, whenever you talk about what exactly is the benefit of holding more, sometimes communities will offer staking options um, and they'll have their own actual currency. And you can use this to purchase other NFTs. Um, there's also community wallets called a DAO. And whatever uh, royalties are made. And this is you know, why I enjoy getting in projects uh, ahead of time. If they build a good system with a community wallet, then they'll actually be able to purchase NFTs that maybe you didn't have the liquidity for, and they'll end up you know, either raffling them off or selling them through their local currency. Um, so there's you know, coins that you will have through that currency that you can buy, and you didn't really do anything other than be an early adopter in that project. For sure. Now, before we get into DAOs, royalties, staking, let's take it one more step back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, let's explain what are NFTs used for? So someone's like, okay, I, I spent, let's say $200 minting these NFTs. What can I then use these pictures for or this digital ownership to do with that's actually valuable. Yeah, so some have a specific community to where you'll gain access to. Um, others will offer different opportunities for you to uh, get exclusive access to live in-person events. Um, they will also offer, like I said, staking options to where you will we'll generate different income opportunities. And then, you know, some of these also give you access to free NFTs whenever they release a second generation. Uh, if you were original holder, then they will give you an additional one. Now, when you talk about real life use cases and where this is going, once again, you got to remember we're very early in the space, but at some point I will go buy a home and instead of writing a bill of receipt, they'll send me an NFT that is my actual home. And it will show that I'm, you know, the actual holder and owner of this home through a transaction based. Uh, we got to understand where the world is going right now and everything's turning to digital. Uh, so this is, you know, instead of doing documentations and formal signings and paperwork, you'll be going through these different types of transactions. So, you know, that's where I look at this is these use cases that are building, they're still growing. Uh, and whenever you're in this space doing research, you'll see common themes in between them. Like they'll set up a DAO, they'll set up staking options. The projects that I look at usually are outside the box of that, though, you know, with the understanding that a lot of these projects are only going to last, you know, a few months at a time. Uh, these true ones that are out there pioneering different ways and utilities are the ones that will stand out, you know, future down the road. Um, so that's, you know, really where you get into it's still being made. We're still super early in the process. And that's what a lot of people who are listening to this may think that they missed the boat. I personally thought I missed the boat on NFTs whenever, you know, I started seeing the Board Ape Yacht Club and CryptoPunks. And I was like, wow, I don't even have enough Ethereum sometimes to cover the gas fees on this, let alone, you know, go buy an NFT. And then Solana released this whole, you know, almost part two. And I felt like there's life breathed back into me. So that's what I'm saying is like, you know, even with 
people who saw Bitcoin first, you know, felt they missed the boat and then there was Ethereum. Well, now I feel like I missed the boat on Ethereum NFTs, but I was there for the second runner up with Solana. And the difference is, you know, gas fees and expenses are <laughs> next to pennies on Solana blockchains currently. For sure. I think that's the most important thing that everyone listening to this needs to understand is how early we really are. So if you miss Bitcoin, that's fine. You missed Ethereum, that's fine. You missed Tether, that's fine. You missed the Binance IPO, that's fine. You, you missed Doge, that's fine. You missed Shiba, that's fine. There's always yeah. another kind of thing that's going to come and just beat the last, uh, the last return. So folks, we're, we're still pretty early on this game. Now, there's different platforms that you can trade NFTs, mint NFTs on. There's Ethereum and there's Solana. Solana is the faster, cheaper alternative to Ethereum. From your experience, what have you seen as the difference between using both of those besides just the, the costs? And have you seen the communities uh, on either one kind of develop faster? Which one's taken the cake? So uh, it, it's definitely interesting because both of them have their benefits, you know, and their downsides. A lot of people almost turn their nose up at Solana NFTs and consider them as like a second tier. Uh, and what's funny is they're still artwork. They're still NFTs. It's just built on a secondary blockchain. Um, so it's the only backlash that you're hearing are from people who were original Ethereum NFT owners on, you know, that side of the, the blockchain. You, you know, and whenever you look at this, they're upset that they spent two, three hundred dollars on gas fees when I bought 10 different NFTs for the same price, you know. So in my opinion, the obvious difference is the amount of cost that goes into them, you know, and there's so many projects now getting launched on Ethereum to where it's kind of washed out in a lot of different ways. Like, yes, there's some of those, you know, heavy hitters that come out. Like I saw something about some sort of cat that was designed by Marvel that got released on Ethereum the other day. You know, and I'm sure that that project sold out within, you know, seconds, minutes and ended up mooning. You know, that happens all the time on Solana's blockchain. There's probably about 20 to 30 different projects that are launching every single day. And one or two of them is usually amazing, you know, and you just have to kind of filter through that process to understand what is good and what isn't. But when you talk about comparisons, they're still NFTs. They're still on blockchains, you know. So in my opinion, I think Solana is better just because. I don't have to pay the extreme gas fees and they're coming out with secondary utilities to where now I can trade um, through a secure platform without having to pay any transaction fees. Uh, so there's just so much more utility I'm seeing built on Solana, as well as some of the Ethereum NFT owners are transferring over to Solana because of the gas fees. And you see them come in and swoop up some of these projects overnight and uh, you see the floor price, you know, start to rise uh, tremendously just because there's more liquidity coming in, uh, just like we see throughout the market in every different space. I mean, so it sounds like Solana is more for the people. That's for sure. <laughs> and because um, that's kind of what it seems like is like the entire crypto space was made to democratize the financial industry just to give everybody a chance to get in and get involved. So Solana just being cheaper and having it more available, I just feel like is going to invite a lot more people just because of that small difference. Now, yeah. another thing that's democratizing is you mentioned DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. Can you explain to folks your experience with DAOs and your, your, from your perspective, what DAOs are? Yeah. So uh, this is basically access to a community wallet, uh, meaning that uh, inside of your community, you're able to start voting on how you spend that money. Uh, so realistically, if you get in a good enough project, um, you know, once again, the Board Ape Solana Club, their current DAO has over $350,000 in it, you know, and we then as a community get to determine how we spend that $350,000 that can be reinvesting back into the project that can be building a better website that can be releasing a second collection that can be, you know, paying out royalties to the holders, um, you know, for those who are actual owners of it. So uh, how so do whenever... NFT holders get to decide what to do with the money? Is there a voting mechanism? How do you get to put your say in? Yeah, so that's where the community development comes in and understanding the project that you're getting into. Um, a DAO-focused community is driven through uh, decision makings. So they will run actual polls and votings inside uh, their discords and their community channels uh, to understand how and what the community actually wants to do with the money. Um, so it keeps the decentralized approach you know, to the funds saying, hey, this isn't, you know, the developer's money, this is the holder's money, you know, what do you want to do with it? And most um, projects that are truly DAO based uh, show complete transparency with the liquidation and where the funds are going, 
um, and how but to the leverage money, the funds. The money is still in custody of the developers, though. So it's Absolutely. really just like if you trust them or not. Absolutely, man. That's why I said I go directly to the developer every time, you know, and okay. most of the time I ask for a voice call. So I actually try to speak to them, you know, because I'm a very energetic person. I, I read the vibrations of people and the energy and I can hear, you know, the intentions in their voice. So whenever you speak with somebody, you can really get a grasp on what direction they're wanting to go if they're here for the longevity and the run of it, uh, as well as some of these will uh, remove themselves from owning the DAO and they'll give it back to the community. So they'll remove the uh, actual you know, the DAO from their hands and they'll give it to some of the moderators to keep it decentralized one step further. Um, and, and those are really, really impressive to see because that shows that he's like, hey, I did, you know, the front end work. Now this is where, where do we want to take it as a collective? Okay, awesome. Um, if I, I also kind of want to take it a step back just in terms of practicality for someone. When I was getting into this space, got burned a few times, fell, I got sent a few messages in Discord, didn't check the legitimacy of the message click the wrong launch launch pad <laughs> yeah done that before man <laughs> i burned one and a half ethereum on this one uh mint that i tried to do a huge lesson there i'm not doing that again so if you could walk people through <laughs> um some mistakes that were made in your journey while you were learning this and what people should be really aware of in this space <laughs> <laughs> As I've watched other podcasts uh, that you've ran before, this is always the most interesting question to hear everybody's trauma that they've experienced, but it always comes down to the trauma is what has made you come out on the other side of it, you know, so uh, of course I have had projects where I've dumped, you know, a couple of grand into, you know, minting and then once again it's what's called a rug pull and as soon as it, you know, is done minting then you never go live with the project and you basically just handed your money directly to a developer. Um, I did that early on, you know, when I was looking at what's called a derivative, and it's uh, just basically the same artwork or copies of maybe pre-existing artwork that was built on another blockchain already, and it wasn't really original. And whenever you don't look for original artwork, then you take the run of all sorts of copyright infringements and different, you know, takes on it. So that was, you know, one of my earliest mistakes was just minting collections that I didn't do additional research on. I just went with, you know, something that I thought was going to look cool or was going to perform better. Um, but I just wasn't, I was blindly shooting, really. You know, I, I wasn't making educated investments. Um, so I haven't really had anything too scarring, you know, a, a couple thousand dollars here and there isn't terrible. Yeah. So I've had my few rug pulls, but nothing, nothing traumatic yet. <laughs> okay. That's good to hear. In terms of when people are trying to learn about the very beginnings of this space, yeah. they can't just jump into the first Discord they see and get caught up in all the noise. So what should somebody be trying to do to take their first couple baby steps in the right direction here? The first step is find you a mentor. Find you somebody that actually has been in the space and do what they do. Um, that's the thing is so many people try to do it on their own. And the whole basis of NFTs is community driven. It's, you know, we live in this time in this world where a lot of people were uh, told to social distance for however long and separate themselves. And we almost see the rubber band effect coming through NFTs right now with this community driven focus. Uh, so it's always amazing whenever you can actually find some of these communities to trust and lean on. And, you know, you take these opinions and especially in the Solana blockchain now, um, there's developers who are coming out with multiple projects time and time again. So if you find a developer that you like, then you stick to however many collections that they're going to be mm. launching because you know that they're going to be successful. Okay, that's actually really, really interesting. So that's a good way to keep yourself, you know, around trustable people is just to stick to the developers that have had success in the past. Yeah, as well as the artists. Um, so most of the artists are, you know, known and uh, they will come out with different collections. So, you know, I, I follow the de developers and the artists to understand where they're coming from. Uh, there was something that was released the other night uh, called Best Buds on Solana. Uh, I don't know if you were able to get a couple of those, but, you know, that's where uh, the founder of what's called the Stoned Ape Crew uh, has done, you know, a good job of creating their, uh, their NFT and their community. And they came out with almost this like spinoff second generation, which was Best Buds, and they're looking to build a teamwork uh, together. So now you've got this space where NFT communities are coming together and, you know, creating two decentralized DAOs, but driven toward one, you know, focus point. So you've now extended the community from, let's say, 6,000 original mints to now you've got 12,000 and so on and so on. So when you're getting into these projects, 
you get into a first generation or second generation because let's say a year from now they're on generation five and if you're a holder of their first or second generations then you get whitelisted on projects you get free nfts you get additional revenue streams and like i said phantom wallet is just now about to integrate into the ethereum chain so once when that happens solana is going to go crazy you got to understand like everybody's attention has been on ethereum because you see justin bieber bought you know this or whatever that may be but now whenever you see the integration happen and it is for the people and it's inexpensive compared to what some of these other transactions have been you know like like i said i tried to go do an uh, ethereum based purchase and the transaction was 200 dollars in fees and i was like that just it's not feasible for somebody to just say that's okay you know so when you yeah when for sure. when, <laughs> when my mom goes to go purchase one and i say hey mom this is you know you're gonna go buy it for 30 dollars, and you're gonna own your first nft it's more uh it's more digestible for the newcomer to enter this space um so i'm excited on where we're going man really for really sure. Dude, I I'm sitting on a bunch of Ethereum and if, so after the uh, after I got scammed that one day, I went back the next day and uh, took part of the actual project, the legitimate project. And I'm sitting on those NFTs and I can't sell them because the, the gas fees to even list them <laughs> is so high that it's just not worth it. It's gonna I won't make any money. So that's pretty frustrating. But let's say okay, I got I did the pro I did the research, found the developers, found the artists, I funded my wallet. Okay, I got money in my Phantom wallet. I went to the launch pad. I minted a whole bunch of NFTs. They're now in my phantom wallet. I'm excited. I got these pictures. I don't know what to do with them. What are the three or four things that I can do with these NFTs to then make money? What do I do with these pictures? Beautiful. So um, some of the, the number one thing that I look for currently is uh, NFTs that allow you access into the metaverse some way or somehow. Uh, we see a lot of the big, you know, uh, the big minds in the world driving their attention as well as some of these big companies driving their attention into the space. Uh, so a lot of the NFTs will actually grant you access to having a character in the metaverse that looks like your NFT. Um, there's other ones uh, that actually are building casinos inside of uh, the metaverse and you can actually grab passive income from owning an NFT. So there's one called Lucky Lotto that I've been holding. Uh, and they've got a they've got a casino inside the metaverse that they distribute royalties to all of the holders. So I get a biweekly passive income disbursement from people who are gambling in the metaverse. Now, I personally, I'm not in the Hold metaverse on. in I'm any sorry. way. I'm sorry. Pause. 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 Sorry. You're telling me somebody who's watching this for spending, <laughs> let's say, 90 bucks on Solana to yeah. mint an NFT could then get access to generating passive income from a virtual casino right i've already made back my nft uh three times over and i will have that passive income as long as that community continues to grow and thrive you know for however many years to come and that's why we are once again early we're in the cutting edge and if you get into these communities that are here now imagine the ability of a dow building itself currently rather than a DAO building itself a year down the road when all the metaverse land is sold out you know these big platforms are already you know congested we are already building the roots now so that's why it's super important to get in to some of these passive income opportunities now all right we're gonna have to go to virtual real estate in a sec because this is something i personally don't understand because yeah. you know I'm, I'm trying to get my head around it but what to go back to the casino thing what currency are you getting paid in what token are you getting paid in uh solana directly uh so they're actually are you being serious 100 percent, man how and, do i get and involved no, this is for me. <laughs> so for everyone who's listening who has their first NFT. Like, how do you get involved? Do you, do you have to find a specific casino project and then uh, see if you qualify? Like, can you walk us through that? Man, it's as simple as a transaction that I told you earlier. You just got to do the research. So they actually come out with an NFT coin um, and they'll come out with different tiers. So there's a rainbow, a copper, a silver, a diamond. And if you're a holder of a rainbow, uh, then you get, I think it's like 20% of all royalties distributed. Uh, if you're a different tier and so on and so on, you get a different percentage. Um, so that's how they create rarity systems within these own NFT communities is sometimes if you're a holder of this coin, you get an additional royalty payout. But once again, you just have to hold the NFT. So what does that even mean? Inside of your phantom wallet, you're actually able to see every NFT that you own. And through the blockchain system and through that wallet, the developers um, have uh, access to that to send you direct funds. Uh, and you verify through these Discord channels to ensure that you're a valid holder of the NFT. 
Um, so they so, direct deposit all of these commissions straight to your phantom wallet? Absolutely, man. I, I get a free about $2,000 now uh, every week in passive income through my NFTs. So like I said, doing this space is a hell of a lot less stressful than trading was because I now just have NFTs that I got in at the foundation. And like I said, the metaverse is only going to grow. You know, am I personally going to partake in it? I don't really feel like it, you know, but I know people will. I know where attention goes, energy will flow, and this space is only going to get bigger. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. So I didn't mean to cut you off when we were talking about casinos. You were listing the four ways or some various ways that folks can make <laughs> money. So you can have a character that's in the metaverse that represents your yeah. character. You yeah. can have, um, you can take part in these different virtual institutions that'll pay you a commission. And then what yeah. else, how else besides just outright selling it and listing it? Yeah. So uh, obviously, yeah, outright selling it is another X multiplier of it. You know, you meant for a certain price and selling it. But if you're a holder of the collection, um, once again, they can give you their own uh, their own native currency. Uh, so how you can spend that native currency is through an option called staking. Uh, and you can stake your actual NFTs on different platforms that says, hey, I'm not planning on selling this anytime soon. Uh, and what that will do is that will create a rarity and a, an additional value inside the community that there's not too many listed, you know. So when you go onto a project and you see almost all of them available for sale, it doesn't necessarily make it as lucrative, you know, to the to the human experience. Um, so when you stake this, you're telling the community and the developers that you're here for the long run uh, and they will reward you with the passive native currency that then can be used to purchase NFTs that the DAO so the DAO, the community wallet, let's say has $300,000 in it, and there's a project that's minting, they may drop 10 grand on the project and then distribute a free NFT to everybody who's been staking their NFT there. So you didn't have to actually buy that NFT just by being a holder in another project and staking it and saying you're there for the long run, they reward you with free NFTs, which then you can sell or you can, you know, do whatever that use case is for as well. So those are called airdrops, right? Right. So, and that's also through your wallet. You just have to be a holder and the developer will see it and it happens passively. You don't have to actively do anything. This is so fascinating. So people are listening to this and they're like, okay, well, obviously the whole game is figuring out the right projects, which is the same thing everywhere. If you want to make money in stocks, people, you got to find the right stocks. And so right. Austin, you mentioned finding a mentor, someone who's already in this game, who understands the mechanics of it. What should someone be looking for in a mentor or in somebody trustworthy in the space to really trust what they're saying? There's going to be a whole lot of fluff in this market. Let's go ahead and so be it's, honest it's about all, that. It's always interesting, uh, you know, and once again, it's a judging character and, and person. Uh, I usually stay away from the people that are super flashy with it and, you know, showcase the dollar amounts and what they're doing. Because sometimes, in my opinion, the, uh, the underlying factor is money there you know, and it's not the best interest of the person. So whenever you are looking for somebody to trust, understand that they have to be providing value and it has to be facts and it has to be information that like I'm sharing with you, you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, the artwork's sick. That's not good enough to show like this is a valid reason to enter the project. You know, you think about trading and all the confirmations that you look for to enter a trade, you know, you add up five or six different confirmations. Well, the same has to be for these NFTs whenever you're entering them. Um, so whenever you're looking for a developer or, you know, a, a mentor to look for, go through the same checklist. You know, does this person align with your moral values? You know, do they actually live a lifestyle that is authentic or is this something that is kind of just the flashy, you know, follow me, you know, I personally, I don't sell anything. Like I've never asked for money through anyone or anybody because I'm making my own you know that's number one kind of thing for me is i know a lot of traders will create courses and opportunities you know to generate that because it gives them some financial uh l some less stress through their financials uh because they're creating that passive income you know but if you're looking for somebody to do this with find somebody who's in it just like you are you know have somebody that has the same passion level that you are and in somewhere similar in life that you are uh, because they're going to be able to relate to you better they're going to be taking the same calculated risk that you are their finances are going to be in a similar situation than yours and that's one of those where you just want to meet people that resonate with you and you can trust uh, and that's where you know once again building the community uh, is essential i've been trying to build a community of just trustworthy people who are 
you know, entrepreneurs looking to, you know, make, uh, make a difference in this space. Uh, so you just got to really find the people. Uh, it's all that it is. Who resonates with you? That's awesome. Austin, are you coming to the FX Summit in Miami this year? Man, so uh, it's funny. My wife and I were currently sitting on the beaches of Texas. We live in a, uh, <laughs> we live in a self-converted shuttle bus and we travel the U.S., um, but I did, uh, I did also slip into her ear that I may have to fly out down to uh, the FX Summit, uh, especially after doing this now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'd definitely love to see you out there. Um, this has been an awesome conversation, Austin. And I know that we might have to have a part two for this after we kind of, after folks get a chance to digest this. Is there anything that you have your eye on today without going into too much detail? Anything that's catching your eye today that you want folks to be aware of? Man, looking at it, honestly, the number one thing that I can say is go to magiceden.io. This platform is the number one platform currently for Solana-based NFTs to uh, launch on. So the website is actually running on their website uh, and on their homepage a list of the next 20 projects that are launching on their space. Go ahead and click on every single one of those and start doing comparison and researches. You know, you will be able to click on their uh, their project and look at the Twitter, you'll be able to look at the discord, join the community, ask questions and start doing research. You know, that's what I did was hours and hours of digging through projects that had already launched and were successful. So what, you know, stood out from, let's say, the stoned ape crew that was having a 55 floor already. And what did their Twitter look like? What did their discord community look like? And then a project that's about to launch you know, did they look similar? Did it look, you know, completely different? What was the validations in between the two? So you see some confluences on what's worked in the past to what's working, you know, going to be working moving forward. Um, and that's how you can take advantage of these situations. So back testing. So a, back, little, man, a lot absolutely. of back testing. We're right back to square one. <laughs> all right. Absolutely. Um, that's really awesome. I appreciate you sharing all this value. I think folks, if you guys are listening to this at home, this was such a clear cut guide on how to get started. If you guys aren't licking your chops and going on there, just like, I can't wait to get into this market. You need to go back and rewatch this interview. Austin, can't thank you enough for getting on and sharing this value. Appreciate it, boss. It's been so much fun. Looking forward to part two. All right, there we go. Yeah, so on launch day with the project, that's the number one opportunity to experience the emotions of the market. So this is where you will see, you know, the psychological factor when you uh, see the euphoria at the top and then anger down at the bottom. From the time that it mints and then goes live on the launch pad, you will start to see what's called FOMO, live in action. You'll see people understanding if this project is going to go to the moon and it's the best thing ever, or if it hits the floor. So on project launch days, sometimes it will go from a one soul mint up to a 10 to 20 soul floor, which means you've 10x or 20x your project. Now, if you study that psychological emotion of the market cycle, euphoria is usually felt on launch day. And then those secondary adopters are buying actually the dip. So then they experience what we're currently going through in the crypto cycle is people who bought Bitcoin at 60K, 50K, 40K, and they're sitting in anger. You know, people who hear about the project after the fact are buying on the way down on the dip. And then, you know, the actual people who sold out at Euphoria will buy the dip again and then ride the cycle back up. So you see this literally every day and from studying training or trading and understanding that repetition of cycle it's in every single space and you see it within cryptos and within nfts as well okay so do you see the nft cycle following the overall crypto cycle or are they two independent ecosystems now so they're they're independent ecosystems it's almost like uh we saw DeFi, you know start to separate itself out and start this decoupling process and riding the bear market not as strongly you know with different staking options and different features so it comes back to the utility of these nfts and what actually is the use case for them? Some of them during the bearish market will increase their staking opportunities to be able to, you know, say, hey, we, we hear you loud and clear, but we're going to still double down on this again. Um, so you both, both definitely have their emotional cycles. NFTs are one of those that during a bear market, a lot of people will purchase because it is inexpensive. And like you said, right now, Solana is at the lowest it's ever going to be. It's at like 90 or 100 bucks. You know, but here's the beauty about an NFT. If the floor price stays at one soul, right now it's worth 90 or $100. In two months from now, let's say Solana's at three, $400, then you still doubled or tripled your revenue. So it's still better than almost holding. You know, you've got many more opportunities to now multiply your current investment. So in terms of 
let's say that I have more faith in the Solana developers and the Ethereum developers of the Ethereum project and the Solana project, and I don't feel so comfortable keeping my money in the NFT. Is there like a certain balance that you have between holding some in the actual token or the, the main coin or holding them in an NFT? Yeah, so uh, I actually usually split my projects. So if, you, if you're looking to invest into a project, I always say be able to mint three to five of them. So that way you've got some actual validation into the project and a reason to stick around. Um, now with that, I'll have my one or two that I plan on holding forever. And this is built on the utility and use case. Those other three, uh, I'm looking to sell back into the market, you know, either making a quick flip or just covering my reinitial investment. Um, you know, so then you're getting back that liquidity as well that then you can use for other projects down the road that will be continuing to launch time and time again. Uh, so you want to keep this fine balance of holding the couple that you actually need and then being a part taker in the market and facilitating them to late adopters into the party. Okay. So in terms of, you said that you're holding a few forever. So what does forever mean? And then how are you planning on using that uh, in the future to drive value for yourself? Yeah. So uh, honestly, I'm, I'm holding a few NFTs when, whenever I say forever, that means until I need to sell them. And now what does that actually mean? I don't know. You know, I look at NFTs as a, once again, I'm taking out liquidity from the market and I'm putting it into a tangible asset. So even if both of them went to zero, no harm, no foul. I didn't really actually lose anything. Now, the idea is to keep it tangible, to keep the winners, you know, that actually will turn into a really good multiplier. Um, so me personally, I'm holding them until I need something. You know, if I have a house that I want to go buy, you know, I was, my goal this year was to build a portfolio of 400,000. So that way my wife and I can go build a home after this year, you know, so I will then liquidate the NFTs that I need in order to turn it into a tangible, you know, asset. Um, so that, that's where I look at it is just build the collection out until you're able to create that reality. That's so awesome. And that's very counter to what most people think, which is like, I, I need to sell this stuff. It's like, oh, I hope Bitcoin goes to 100K so I can sell my Bitcoin. But then they don't understand that there's a lot of value being driven in owning this stuff and actually being able to, you know, hold it until you need it. Until you really there, need there's, it. there's a project that just launched uh, called the Pen Club. And they're actually sending holders of their NFT an actual pen that's going to have a geo uh, chip inside of it that will exclusively access you into different um, events around the world. So you will be a holder of this NFT and they're physically going to send you a pin that you can wear into some of these exclusive events and it'll grant you access to it. So, you know, that type of stuff, like I have one that I'm going to hold forever. What is the event going to be? I don't know. Maybe it's a free concert. You know, maybe it's a FX summit that I get acceptance into. Like who knows? <laughs> oh, the FX summit NFT. Might have to work on uh, might have to work hey. on something like that. Um, okay, so what else you got, man? No, there's a bunch of questions. Most of my questions are like specific to bigger picture because the way yeah. that I look at markets is in terms of the macro. Like, where's the overall yeah. uh, the overall trend going? So my thoughts about this would be, in the NFT space, there's this JPEG culture, monkey picture, you know, thing that we have going on, yeah. and yeah. then there's also this community token culture that's starting to kind of drive a lot more traffic. And I feel like personally, I like the community stuff because it gives you access to real life stuff that you want, you know, especially if you're part of that community. Do you still see a place for both in the future? Is one going to have to take the other or can both live in that system? Uh, it's going to be interesting. You know, my biggest thing right now, uh, the art itself is always good, but it's not going to necessarily last. Uh, at the end of the day, most people like tangible artwork you know, to actually hang up in their home. Now I do see people coming up with digitized, you know, artwork frames where they can filter through those. But when you look at a digital asset, um, they're being held in metaverses, you know, they're being held in that type of space. Uh, so I see NFTs lasting in that type of realm for some of the artwork, sure. Uh, but when you look about real life use cases, uh, there's actually going to be NFTs with these utility for focuses that help you in the real world. You know, one of the things that I didn't really talk about was a play to earn NFT. And this is changing the game, man. Play to earn NFTs are going to change everyone's life. I, I mean, Justin, they, shout out to you if you're watching this. 
Yeah, I, guys, I see got that him. town set up. <laughs> I see that. I, I got to go get on the gala chain and, and go look at that setup. Uh, but yeah, man, a, a play to earn. Think about how many times you played a video game as a kid and leveled up, you know, a, a community, a player, a town, a, you know, farm, whatever video game you used to play. Um, and now they're coming out with ones that you can actually own an NFT. It'll give you a character in their play to earn game and you can actually make crypto. So instead of a kid playing, you know, Madden 12, you know, on a PlayStation, they're going to be able to go actually play a game and make money for the household. And we have to, as Americans, remove ourselves as this like, oh, well, that's cool. Like, think about the kid in India or a third world, you know, different type of country that doesn't have access to this. And now at a 10 year old level is playing this video game they're that's making this income, game. right. Yep. And, and bringing in income that is mind-blowing for the average income around the world so we're truly shifting to this you know open opportunity for everyone and that's what i'm most excited about is we're leveling the playing ground for this financial freedom that's so awesome that's such a huge shift into the future which is like everybody has an open opportunity now now there's still issues with an off-ramp so a kid gets paid in gala transfers it to solana can't get the solana to a bank now there's like you know there's certain there's still certain issues that are getting solved, but just the space that's being created here is really impressive. Yeah, honestly, that's those are really the questions that I have for today. No, One sorry. more thing. No, no, no but no, I want you to go into play to earn just a little bit more just to help yep. folks understand how they can get started and how to think about it in terms of like, just in a way that they can understand it better. Beautiful. So um, there's, let's say a play to earn game like Minecraft. Okay, so there's something that just came out called the dirt box. And basically you grant access to this NFT that then gets put into a digitized online game. Um, and once when you're on that system in that game, you get to use that validation of owning it to then work and mine inside of your play to earn game. Uh, so at the end of the day, you're creating data points on the blockchain that help build out that you know system to be more encrypted or secured or whatever it may be. And they give you basically this game that you're playing to generate utility as well as keep you interested and engaged in actually minting further security for the blockchain. So you're like uh, a miner or a node in the Bitcoin chain. Absolutely. That is freaking amazing. And you don't have to have the big devices or the you know hundreds or thousands of dollars for it and run up the electricity bill. Now, like you said, shout out to Justin. I saw him change you know, his screen time saver to be auto lock because he didn't want his computer to turn off. So it may cost you a little bit, but definitely not the same as, you know, these actual minting and mining, you know, machines that are out there right now. That is, that's so awesome. So anybody can use their computer, laptop, phone to now mine or help be a part of the overall chain and then provide either energy or provide liquidity through their NFT so that they can also get paid for it. Yeah, man, it's one of the craziest things <laughs> to think about of just the utility and availability and opportunities in this world. Like I said, trading oh is one God. thing, you know, it, trading has funded a lot of my ability to do this, but people who don't have that type of funding or don't understand that you can still get started for 20 to $30 if you find the right project and 10 extra money, you know, in a matter of 24 hours, and that will change your life forever because now you understand what the process and the cycle looks like. So like I said, find a mentor, find somebody who's plugged into the space that understands what they're looking for and trust them. You know, trust is basically what all of cryptocurrency is built on. You know, where is the emotional trust of people at right now? It's definitely not in a lot of the governments. So it's leaning toward this area, you know, decentralization. So there's so And that's opposite. our soundbite. <laughs> that was it. oh that's so awesome that is so awesome austin Good i really shit, appreciate man. you bro